Good evening everyone and welcome to the Hangout tonight. My name is Agnesha Agrella and I'm hanging out from Johannesburg in South Africa. Please let us know where you're hanging out from and what you can do is just put your name and the city where you're hanging out from in the box um, where we ask for questions and we should be able to then to see where you're hanging out from. So um, for those who are joining us for the first time, um, my name is Agnesha and I'm a craniosacral therapist but I also work in the corporate world where I deal a lot with change so I see a lot of the effect of what change um, do to people. Um, so I work with um, the both worlds, um, the cranial world and the corporate world. And for the last couple of weeks we've actually been talking about uh, what happens in our body when we actually experience very stressful in, uh, situations and events. And I used to call that, or I still call that, the recording in our heads and what it does for us. And um, I'm sure that everybody will uh, agree with me that it's not entirely possible to completely um, stop the recording in our heads. What we can do is we can manage it and, and we can decide how we want to react when there's been a very stressful uh, event in our lives. But um, welcome to this hangout and tonight we're actually going to change direction and we're going to um, talk about health and what does that mean for us. Um, I can see there's um, somebody coming on and uh, somebody, but I can't see the names yet. So if you actually just give me your names, then I'll be able to see who's joining us on the Hangout. Um, and uh, for tonight's e event, I would like to actually introduce um, my guest speaker who's going to be with me. And it's really a big honor for me to, my, to um, welcome Michael to my Hangout. I've had the privilege to study with Michael in London. And I've also attended the Breath of Life conferences since 2003. And it's through these events that I've really learned how generous Michael is with sharing his knowledge and his wisdom. He's got a very special way with connecting with people and in a very special way transferring his knowledge. Michael is also an osteopath and a pioneer teacher in the, in the field of craniosacral therapy since 1987. And he's also the author of a highly acclaimed book, Wisdom in the Body, The Craniosacral Therapy Approach to Essential Health. Michael has many other achievements, and I'm going to hand over to him and allow him to t tell you why he's qualified to talk about the subject tonight. Michael, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi. <laughs> Hello, Agnesia. Good to see you from the other side of the world. Uh, it's been a while since we've otherwise met face to face and a very warm welcome to everybody here who's uh, who's online I think we've got people from all corners of the world joining us this evening so a very warm welcome to you from a, a rather wet London and um, it's really my pleasure to talk about uh, the subject of health and biodynamic craniosacral therapy with you this evening um, apart from being alive, I'm not really sure what my qualifications are to talk about health. Uh, <laughs> only what I experience. Um, and uh, for me, health is um, it's an active principle. Uh, many people think of health as simply the absence of disease. But for me, it's uh, an active sense of well-being, of coherence, of integration, um, and a sense of aliveness that we can feel in our bodies when, when we're feeling connected, when we're in our bodies, and when we're connected to the source of our, our being. Um, there's many different angles that I can take on health, and maybe we'll explore some of those angles as we'll go through the evening. Um, but just as a brief introduction to myself, um, I've been involved in this work, as Agnesia said, pretty well, well since uh, almost 30 years now. I've been involved in teaching craniosacral work, and um, it's my love, it's my passion, and uh, I look forward to, uh, to bouncing some ideas around this with you this evening. So thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And I see Barbara have actually made it. Barbara Kuhn is from Seattle. So welcome to you, Barbara. Nice to have you with us. 
And if I see these other viewers as well who haven't told me yet um, who you are, so if you'd like to tell us, it's really nice to know um, who's out there and who we're connecting with. Um, and in the meantime, I'm just going to share with you a few definitions which I've been playing around with over the last couple of years about what is health. And I've also tried to get a definition from some of the um, dictionaries or even from Google. And the ones that I could find was um, the World Health Organization's definition in 1948 was health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease. Um, and that hasn't changed since 1948. But then during um, 1986, and when they um, compiled the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion, they then published this um, definition, which is, it's a resource for everyday life, not the objective of living. Health is a positive concept, emphasizing social and personal resources, as well as physical capacities. I found a very nice definition from the Buddhist master Osho and in his book um, From Medication to Meditation he says there's only one kind of health and it accompanies us at birth. Illness is a superficial phenomenon and comes occasionally. Health is our nature. Man is part of nature. His health is nothing but being at ease with nature. He then goes on to a uh, quote Paracelsus, which said, until we know the state of your inner harmony, we can at the most release you from your illness, because your inner harmony is the source of your health. But when we release you from one illness, you will immediately catch another, because nothing has been done with regard to your inner harmony. The fact of the matter is that it is your inner harmony which must be supported. And I really loved that definition when I saw it the first time because it really connected with Dr. Sutherland's reference to the breath of life. And I was wondering, Michael, if you can perhaps um, talk to us about the breath of life and maybe explain uh, who Dr. Sutherland is and um, how did he come to, to talk about that, um, that phrase. Is that the same as what our show is referring to as our inner harmony? Sure. Um, Dr. Sutherland was a remarkable osteopath who uh, developed the practice of osteopathy in the cranial field uh, from uh, uh, an initial insight he had around the turn of the last century. And um, he sensed, perceived, had a revelation that subtle rhythmic motion is, uh, is, is a feature of life. He first sensed this as something happening within the cranium and then realized that this is actually a, a whole body process. And, um, and then through his explorations he realized more and more that um, these rhythmic movements are not only restricted to the cranium but and not only to the whole body but are actually a feature of the natural world in which we live and that if we can synchronize to these natural rhythms within the world around us um, then we could say to be in a state of health. Um, I like that definition of health as being something intrinsic of something that you know in a sense which is at our core at our essence as something which isn't lost. Dr. Sutherland talked about a uh, uh, a kind of a that the breath of life, as he called it, is carrying a primary organizing force into the body, which is he, he, he described as having an intelligence with a capital I, something which is far beyond our own human mentality. But the sense that there is some kind of ordering force, some kind of ordering principle, which isn't a function of our emotions or a function of our intellect but which is a function of something perhaps even more primal, primordial, uh, more primary than that. And um, in a sense, um, you know, we can all experience this. I mean, it's not necessarily something, you know, deeply esoteric, but it, it's the sense that no matter what are the conditions in life, no matter, for example, how sick we are, no matter how emotionally upset we are, how depressed we are, how riddled our body might be with disease, this propensity, this capacity to seek the best possible health 
is something that's always going on. So whatever are the conditions, this urge to be in health, to find the greatest possible order and balance and coherence is something which is absolutely indestructible and undeniable. And it's this force, it's this capacity that uh, as craniosacral therapists that we try to synchronize with and then try to encourage and facilitate uh, that expression. Um, in the way of doing that, I, I like uh, the definition that the Tibetans give to health. Um, they have a word for health which in Tibetan is a word called troaten and literally it means that which suits you. So as we re-establish this connection back to our source, back to this primary intelligent organizing force that operates through us, the way we do that is, is deeply individual. It's something that um, you know, would be very different for me as it would be for you and very different for every patient that comes into my practice. Um, so as we journey back into this connection to you know, who we really are, at this, the source of health that is at the core of our being, um, we have to do this in ways which is a very, uh, I would say, a very personal, very individual journey, finding that which we need, that which suits us in order to align with, in order to create the conditions for this primary intelligent organizing force to manifest. So Sutherland, Dr. Sutherland started us out on this journey. He made some remarkable insights. Um, he, um, you know, the breath of life is something which is not an easy thing to talk about. He took the phrase from the book of Genesis um, and uh, really uh, it, it can refer to this kind of spark of life that comes from the source or comes from the Creator. The book of Genesis talks about uh, how the Creator breathes the breath of life into the nostrils made of the man of clay and man becomes a living soul. But it's the sense of this primary vivifying and animating force that vitalizes us and that organizes our form and our function. That's fantastic. Thank you, Michael. And yes, I think um, that part plays a very important role in craniosacral therapy. And although we connect with it, it's not the main thing that we work with. We do work with the physical body. So if we can then talk about um, what is biodynamic craniosacral therapy and why is anatomy um, and why do we look at anatomy and why is it so important for a craniosacral therapist to actually also understand how the body works? Mm -hmm. Well, I think for me, one of the, the, the beauties and, uh, and, and the great kind of uh, efficacy of a biodynamic approach in craniosacral therapy is that it's looking at wholeness. And um, interestingly, um, in the Latin language, the word health and the word wholeness derive from the same root. So again, if we're looking at a definition of health or looking to understand what is health, then uh, we can also think of it in terms of being whole. Now, we never lose our wholeness in the same way that we never lose our health. We may become fragmented in relationship to that wholeness, which is unfortunately how most of us go through our lives, at least, uh, or at least for good parts of the day anyway. Um, but, uh, but that doesn't mean that the health is lost. It doesn't mean that the wholeness is lost. It means that we may have lost our connection to that which is who we really are and what we really are. Um, so biodynamics is really working with wholeness. It's working with, uh, you know, part of our wholeness is the physical body. We are embodied. Uh, being in a body, experiencing life within the body is, uh, is, is a, what can I say, a fundamental part of being a human being and living in this world and, uh, and functioning. So it's something that is, uh, you know, an integral part of the practice. Um, 
But, uh, but it's not only the body, it's also the forces that move through the body. And, uh, and it's the connection also between body and consciousness and mind and body. And I think the beautiful thing within a biodynamic approach is that it's really looking at this as a, as a uh, uh, you know, these different aspects of ourselves as a continuum within, uh, within our wholeness. So the body is important, but it's not treated in isolation. Okay, so does that mean that we actually then um, look for health as um, a whole and that we actually connect with the body but then also looking for where the health is and then work with that to actually bring the body into a more stillness and then what happens in that stillness? Why is it so important for the body to go into that stillness? Sure. Well, the, the, you know, uh, uh, having a perception of the wholeness is is one way into having a perception of the health. If uh, if I'm treating a patient and I'm just looking at them in terms of their bad knee or their, you know, or their 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 their, their prolapsed disc or or whatever it is, um, I'm really losing touch with the wholeness. But if I can orient to whole patient and that this includes the fields of function around the body not just the physical body but it also includes the fields of function in the space around us in the environment around us and if we can look at people within this context because we're constantly interacting with the natural world around us and also with the you know with our own uh, with our own nature there is an integration and an interaction and if those kind of pathways and those interchanges are open between these different parts of ourselves as a continuum, then we can function with a sense of happiness and a sense of healthiness as well as a, as a living experience. And uh, stillness is really um, a way in, it's a skillful means to create the conditions for this reintegration. Um, what we find in pra practice is that if we're able to encourage states of settling, both at a physiological level, but also at an energetic level, and also at the level of consciousness, this provides us for an opportunity for, uh, for reorganizing. It's within the settling, it's within the stillness that we perhaps have an opportunity to recharge, but also come back into alignment with this kind of natural pattern of health which is at our at our source. A kind of way that I like to describe this these days is um, it's a little bit like when you're having a computer problem or a problem with your modem and you call up a helpline and uh, you know maybe you've just sweated 20 minutes on the telephone trying to get through to some helpline and in the Philippines or in some, some far-flung corner and you finally get through to the person who's helping you, what is the first thing that they tell you to do? They tell you, okay, have you tried switching off your computer? Have you tried switching off your modem? Leaving it for a few minutes and then switching it on again. Because if you do, that'll sort out most of the problems. Well, it's that kind of principle that I think works true for the body too, you know, when we're able to find those states where we're able to really just drop and reconnect in the stillness to some deeper levels within ourselves, there is an opportunity for reconnecting to, uh, to these organizing forces that I was referring to. And it's amazing what will happen, you know, it's not just we have a nice rest um, when, when we do this in, in various skillful ways. Um, you know, pathologists get better, people get better from a whole range of different diseases and conditions. So this is an important skill within biodynamic practice. I think the other, the other area which I also um, would like to just touch on is the um, slowing down of the process. I remember in one of our lectures, and I don't think I'll ever forget, um, where we actually was talking about what happens in our bodies when we are so traumatized. And you used the analogy of a frizzy drink 
and you showed us how if that frizzy drink is almost shaken and it's about to explode, what do we have to do to actually help that um, fizzy drink so that it doesn't explode? Mm. Um, and, I'll rin and then the whole thing was about slow the process down. Will you please explain to us why that is important and what happens in our body when mm. we slow that process down as a, as a therapist? Sure. Well, I think essentially for most of us, um, a lot of us, we don't heal from our stresses and strains and our traumas because essentially there's too much that's happening too fast. And, um, you know, so it's uh, particularly if we have that tendency for hyperarousal and overactivation and overwhelm, um, having uh, the, the ability or, or having a practitioner who can support you just to slow your physiology down uh, can be greatly important. Now, this is also important from a practitioner's point of view, working in this field. One of the big challenges for craniosacral practitioners is to slow down their own uh, rhythm and to slow down their own tempo, as it were, so that they can begin to synchronize to the deeper, slower forces of primary respiration or of what is sometimes referred to as the breath of life because it's only when we do that that we're able to synchronize to these deeper organizing forces that can operate through us. So it's A, it's a way of connecting to the deeper organizing forces but B, it's also a way of just helping to down-regulate ourselves, down-regulate our nervous systems um, so that uh, because essentially you know, too much can be happening too fast. Okay, and thanks for that, Michael. And then if we can maybe see, because I think a lot of people who doesn't know what craniosacral therapy is always wonder, well, how do we do that? As craniosacral therapists, what do we do? Um, yes. And how do we actually slow down the process in our clients? It's really done in a very non-invasive way, in a very gentle way. I mean, one of the things we don't do is, uh, you know, kind of put, a, it's a hands-on therapy, I think, as uh, most people know, you know, but we're not kind of holding somebody down on the table and say, okay, sucker, you slow down, uh, you know, you stop there. It's really done through very spacious, open invitation, and also through generating a real sense of holding and safety. I think the safety aspect is absolutely critical here, because when we're under threat, uh, we simply stay within that state of hypervigilance and hyperact uh, hyperactivation. So creating the conditions for safety and holding, which really involves a lot of skills that the practitioner has to develop in creating a safe space for the patient, but also creating a very non-invasive, deeply respectful, mindful space. Um, that, that's an important element within this work. So it's really done through creating a, an open space, an open invitation. There's never any kind of forcefulness. But the work works on the principle. It kind of brings us back to one of the tenets of osteopathic practice, that essentially we are self-healing organisms, and that this, as I mentioned earlier, this capacity for self-healing is something which is uh, indestructible. It's always there. So basically, given half the opportunity, we will take up that invitation, you know, because in a sense it's, it's something that we're always automatically seeking. It's not something that is alien to us. It's not something that's foreign to us. So when we're able to kind of let down the defenses, when we're able to kind of let down the control, and we're able to kind of just drop into, you know, our experience of that present moment, which involves slowing things down, um, you know, then we can begin to reconnect to these deeper organizing forces that Dr. Sutherland described. So I think the key is that it's something that's intrinsic. It's something which is already there. Um, and as a practitioner, we can simply help to create the conditions for, for that to happen. But um, it doesn't mean that it's going to happen every time. It can be a lot of work. It can take a number of sessions before somebody is ready to kind of drop down and slow down and come into some kind of settling or stillness so that they can begin to reconnect to those deeper places within themselves. 
Thank you. That was really nice. Thanks. To, thank you, Michael. Um, if we could then just maybe touch on um, what happens during our training as cranial phacal therapists. Um, why should people come to a cranial phacal therapist, and uh, why will they feel safe um, with a cranial phacal therapist? Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 I'm involved with this work because, in my experience, it's the most beautiful, elegant way to create conditions for healing. I think there's been, um, you know, a, a, a whole uh, kind of legacy of understanding and knowledge that has been developed over the last hundred years or so that uh, you know we we're now working with um, and that as practitioners we uh, you know we can really help to facilitate this process of reconnection in a way the therapist is like a bridge um, you know to help the patient just to reconnect to deeper places within themselves um, and a lot of this also is being borne out now by some of the findings in neuroscience where, for example, um, some of the neurophysiologists are understanding how one person's nervous system will start to synchronize with another person's nervous system with whom they're in close connection. And this is something now that we can measure, we can also understand at a physiological level. So, for example, the uh, spacious holding and uh, settled presence of a, of a trained practitioner can provide a, a, a kind of a reminder for the patient's physiology and this is happening really at a non-verbal level it's happening at a physiological level but as a reminder or as an example for the patient's physiology to begin to synchronize to that which it's lost which they have lost touch with. And uh, so the craniosacral practitioners can facilitate that process in a number of different me in a number of different ways. But you know, one of the primary ways is just through the simple presence of being and simple presence of contact. That's not all there is to it. But there can be a huge amount that can happen that the patient's physiology will naturally start to synchronize to its own health when it's given the space to do that. Yes, I think um, you touched on something there that's very important which I, and which I've experienced in my own life and also with my clients is to actually give them the space. Um, and I see that a lot in the um, corporate world as well where people don't really have the space anymore um, to be able to regulate their own systems. And um, I think the other question that I would like to ask is then, how do we facilitate the inherent treatment plan? We, requ we, we refer to it as the inherent treatment plan. And for me, it's really connecting with the agenda of the, of the client's body so that they will work with what they need to during that session. Sure. And that will give them the space to actually um, resolve whatever is required. But if you can please explain to us, um, what is the inherent treatment plan? Sure. Okay. Well, it's uh, it's a phrase that we use uh, really to describe the fact that there is this primary intelligence that is moving through us, that is working through us, that is constantly seeking health and balance. Um, and the reality is that when I first put my hands on a patient, whoever they are, even if it's somebody I've been treating for years and years and I know really well, the reality is I have absolutely no idea of what needs to happen for that person in that session. And if I go into that session with a kind of a, a preconceived notion of, oh, I know what you need today, I think we should do this and I think we should do that, then I can be really getting in the way of what this kind of intelligent organizing principle that is trying to express itself through the patient's physiology is really wanting to do. So a big part of what we call the inherent treatment plan from the practitioner's point of view is just getting out of the way and being able to listen because you know, in that process I've got to put aside a lot of my needs, a lot of my agendas, a lot of my opinions, a lot of my concepts 
in order to synchronize to what is it that wants to happen through this patient's physiology. What is this physiology wanting to do today? How can I listen to that? How can I support that? Mm -hmm. So the inherent treatment plan refers to the fact that there is this, you know, we know somewhere within us, we know exactly what we need in order to heal. We don't necessarily know it intellectually. Yeah, we may not even know it verbally, we may not even be able to give it words, but there is something within us, there's some kind of intelligent organizing principle which is working through the body that knows exactly what it needs to do and that knows which order it needs to do it in. So for example, if a client of mine comes in with a lower back problem, um, it may not be the lower back that I've got to work with first. It may be that something else has to be addressed. Maybe, you know, an old injury at the ankle or uh, something happening in the neck or elsewhere in the body has to be worked with first before the back problem can be addressed. So the inherent treatment plan, it doesn't always mean following where the symptoms are within the patient. And this is sometimes a an interesting thing to explain to people because somebody may come in with a headache and you might go down to the lower back initially and they think, you know, what on earth are you doing? So you might have to explain that, you know, I think there's something going on here that I need to work with first. Um, uh, and, uh, but, but this is also what's true. And it's also not, the, the, what we call the inherent treatment plan isn't chronological. Um, so it, it doesn't mean, for example, that you know, we have to work through our most recent stresses and that somehow we kind of backtrack and that we kind of, you know, relive and, you know, go back right the way through to the very, you know, chronologically to all the problems that we have ever since we were born or since the, you know, we were in the womb or since conception or, or wherever. Um, we really don't know, you know, this is the thing, we really don't know what is ready to be worked with. But, if we put our hands on our patients and we can listen and we can synchronize to the rhythmic movements of what Sutherland called primary respiration, which is really an expression of these organizing forces both inside us and also around us. So if the practitioner has the skills to be able to synchronize to those rhythmic, slower rhythmic movements, and to wait for some kind of settling, what we find is that within the patient there will be a kind of a decision made, there will be a certain issue, a certain problem, a certain place of holding or tension or inertia will start to show itself which will be the thing that is ready to be worked with. And then the practitioner can then come into relationship with that using a variety of different skills. I mean, there's not only one skill, there's a range of skills that we can use and some would be appropriate and some may not for that particular situation. So in a way, really, the inherent treatment plan is something that we uh, will listen for at the start of the session and that will create the conditions for a slowing down and a settling within the patient's physiology so that this decision or that this kind of, um, you know, uh, you could say that the, 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 the organizing forces or the organizing potencies that are expressing within that particular patient will just simply begin to express where they need to go, what they need to work with, which particular issue is ready to be worked with at that particular session. So this is really, um, you know, I think this is a lot of the fun of working as a craniosacral therapist because in a sense you're always flying by the seat of your pants. You never really know what's going to happen. and You never really, you know, it's very, very unpredictable. Um, but it's, uh, it's what makes the work so so interesting and I also think so nourishing and, and, and such fun to, to work with as well. Um, but it requires a quality of listening, a deeper quality of listening 
that most of us uh, very rarely encounter in our lives. We never give this a chance to really operate through us. And, uh, and this is what a, uh, you know, a skillful craniosacral therapist can do. Thanks for that. And yes, I think uh, the one thing that um, we as therapists have to get used to is to work with the unknown and how to be comfortable with that. But I would like to just explore a little bit as we talk about a lot about listening. Would you mind just explaining to um, people who's non-therapists is how do we actually listen? And mm. what does it mean when we say we listen? Sure. Well, I think listening is an, a something that happens through our whole sensorium. Um, Dr. Sutherland talked about listening fingers. I mean, we, you know, we, we work through touch. Uh, so we're working to sense the tendencies, the natural tendencies, the natural movements that are expressing through, through the patient's physiology. Um, so, you know, one of the ways of listening is, is of course, you know, that the hands are like, uh, uh, I describe them as perceptual antennae. Uh, through which we can pick up on information. But how we receive that information, it's not just limited to the hands. We're really listening to our whole sensorium. So, you know, what we would call the five senses, but certainly not limited to the five senses, because, you know, the thought that we only have five senses is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, um, you know, I think um, at the last count, I... Uh, I, uh, I think I was able to identify something like 50 senses that we have, you know, when I actually pedantically went through all of the different senses that we could, uh, that we might be able to name. You know, we have a wide range of sensory experience through which we can register information and through which we can sense what's going on within ourselves and within our patients. But one of the skills that the practitioner has to develop in this process is a skill of being in touch with their own body because it's only through that quality of mindful embodiment that we can begin to listen to those subtle sensations, those subtle signals that are either coming through our hands or maybe we're feeling it with our heart or we're feeling it through our gut instinct or we're feeling it in a number of different ways or through our fascia, uh, which is also a sensory organ. So, you know, we're constantly having access to many levels and many aspects of sensory experience. And I think that uh, each practitioner can develop their own way of listening, you know, it's not uniform. Um, so, for example, as a therapist, Agnesia, you know, you may find it easier to listen in certain ways and through certain parts of yourself and at certain different levels of yourself. You know, that might be just a more natural uh, propensity for you. Um, and that might be just a different way to the way that I listen. But, um, but that's absolutely fine because there's such a wide range of possibilities there. Um, so, you know, a primary way of listening is through touch. It's through, you know, picking up information through the hands. But it's certainly not limited to that. It's being open, you know, really with the totality of ourselves to whatever it is that's happening within the patient. And again, this is one of, I would say, the uh, the great challenges of craniosacral practice. Um, you know, I mentioned right at the beginning, I've been doing this work for around 30 years. Um, but, you know, honestly, um, I, I'm a beginner. Um, you know, because you know, there is such a, a huge capacity that I think each of us has for developing sensory awareness, which for most of us is so untapped, you know, it's not something that they teach us in school, sadly. Wouldn't it be wonderful if they did? Well, we teach it in craniosacral therapy school because this is, these are the tools of our trade, you know, is to develop that capacity for sensory awareness. So when I talk about listening, it's not, you know, not just meaning through the ears or through the hands, but it means opening up you know, really our ability to sense in a number of different ways. Where is the health within this patient? 
What is the health wanting to do? Can I access a sense of wholeness within the patient? Can I synchronize to a sense of wholeness within this patient? And through that synchronization, can I start to notice how the patient's physiology may then start to take the cues that are being offered, the invitations that are being offered, for it to come into re a, a reconnection and a reintegration with its own wholeness. So this is such a rich and, and I say, ongoing uh, area of study. And, uh, and it's also why this work will never, ever be boring. You've always got more to learn, and you never really know what needs to happen. It's beautiful. What a lovely way to make a living. And thank you. You've um, expressed it so beautifully and you explained how we listen so beautifully. So thank you for that. I'd just like to also ask the viewers if they'd like to have specific questions, if they will um, type them into the um, Q&A area um, and then I will read them out and we'll ask Michael um, to answer them for you. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them in the area for us. Um, I think then the, the last question I'd like to ask Michael is, is just to maybe explain to us what can a client expect if they go to, uh, to a craniosacral therapist the, the first time or if they've never heard about it, what can they expect in mm. a session? Well, this is a, this is a tricky question. I'm not sure how to answer. I mean, one part of me would like to say, well, they can expect to come into contact with themselves at a deeper level. They can expect to, uh, you know, to, 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 to reintegrate, to find connection to their health. Um, but at the same time, I think, isn't it wonderful if we can also let go of those expectations? Um, because um, if we can just really be open to whatever it is that wants to happen. Sometimes when we come into a session with a preset notion of our idea of what should happen, even if it's a preset notion of, you know, this is, uh, you know, I want to come into contact with this realm of health that is always there, um, we might be missing what actually needs to happen. So I would suggest that clients come in with an open mind. Um, they don't really need to have expectation. Um, but really with an open mind to be able to follow whatever it is that wants to move within themselves and to be able to stay in touch with that. And I think if we're able to do that, then we can begin to synchronize to this deep intelligence that Dr. Sutherland was describing as these primary forces that can move through us and operate through our physiologists. So, um, yes, you know, come in and feel confident that this work has the potential to reconnect us to deeper levels of health, and then at the same time, let's let go of expectation. And I'm then going to ask uh, Michael, just in closing, what would you like to leave the audience with? Well, first of all, Agnesia, I just want to say a big, big thank you uh, for organizing these events. And uh, I think it's absolutely wonderful what you're doing in, uh, in your work and in raising awareness for craniosacral therapy. And I hope you make it to the top of Kilimanjaro <laughs> and you get lots of, uh, lots of good help and support along the way to do that. Um, you know, I would... Uh, I would just uh, really would like to wish the audience well. Um, it's been a real pleasure talking to you about these things tonight. Uh, if you're interested in some of the things that we're organizing in London through my school, which is called the Craniosacral Therapy Educational Trust, uh, you can go to our website, which is www cranio, that's C-R-A-N-I-O, dot co, dot UK. Uh, we have a range of courses, 
uh, introductory courses, some free events if you want to find out a little bit more about this work, introductory weekends, we have two-year practitioner training courses, uh, we have a living anatomy and experiential anatomy and physiology foundation course for people who uh, haven't got prior training in anatomy and physiology. And we've also got a fantastic uh, uh, range of continuing professional development courses for practicing craniosacral therapists and cranial osteopaths. So um, you know, we're, we're very blessed, I think, to be involved with this work. We're very blessed with a wonderful teaching uh, faculty, uh, some great colleagues in this work. Um, so if this work is of interest to you, whether you're an existing practitioner or you're wanting to get some treatments, or uh, we also have a low-cost clinic in London uh, where we provide treatments for, uh, for very little money. Uh, this is with second-year students as well as experienced practitioners. Um, so come and check out what it is we're doing or, or just find a practitioner in your area and uh, I hope this work supports you in the way that it supports me and, uh, and I hope that it gives you as much uh, warmth uh, and, uh, and connection to, to love and, uh, and connection to stillness that I feel uh, deeply blessed by that uh, that it gives me and it's been giving me over the years so um, I hope that these few words and in some way have whetted your appetite and uh, inspired you to take whatever it is the next step that you need to take uh, in your lives and uh, in your reconnection to the health that's never lost so thank you so much for listening I really appreciate your company and thank you to you, Michael. Thank you for your time and your support. I really appreciate the fact that you took some time to, to share with me on the Hangout. And um, yes, I hope to see you soon in London. Um, and I'm sure I will try my best to make it to the top of Kilimanjaro. I've started my training. Um, and I am terrified, I must admit. Uh, I don't think it can be worse than doing a Hangout. But um, yes, I'm looking forward to it. And um, yeah, I really appreciate all the support I'm getting from everybody around the world. And the, and the list of cranial psychotherapists are growing on our website. So thank you to all of you who are supporting me. And um, yes, please just ask your customers as well or your clients to come and give us a, um, a feedback on cranial psychotherapy. So thank you so much for uh, coming on the Hangout. And thank you, Chris. Thank you for um, your comment. Um, Michael, he says, thank you very much. It's Chris Vells. Um, thank you to Michael for doing the presentation. Um, so thank you, Chris, for joining us. So thank you, um, everybody, for joining us tonight. This is Agnisha Grella from Johannesburg signing out. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>